This is uh, one of our special grand rounds that we have at the end of each year where uh, one of the two chief medical residents uh, gives their farewell speech, so to speak. Uh, <clears throat> last week we had Dr. Rachel Safian and this week we have Dr. Cameron Bass. And it's a deep pleasure each year for me to work with the chief medical residents. It's oftentimes an even richer pleasure to roast them. <laughs> the year. And in this case, Dr. Bass does offer a lot of... Uh, <laughs> target material. So there are several sides to Dr. Bass. There's this side that is sometimes seen. He looks reasonably professional here. <laughs> uh, no tie. In fact, <clears throat> I, I do need to take my jacket off now because I really don't think it's appropriate for me to wear a jacket while you're using the camera. The other side to Cameron, by the way, one of the reasons why I chose Cameron to be chief medical resident was I finally found somebody with more floppy hair than I have. <laughs> now, the other side of Cameron is this side, which is the irreverent side. This was, uh, we actually, we're trying to get a professional picture of him. Um, this was taken in the same month that he won the Consultant of the Year Award from uh, the ED department. They chose a single clinician here at UWMC, and, and uh, this was not the picture we used, but he, he did, he did uh, present himself for his professional picture this way. Uh, bear in mind, too, this was around the time we were looking for psychiatry beds at UWMC for the ED uh, patients. Now, uh, Cameron has shown very early on a predilection for very fine sartorial prowess. And uh, here is, here's Cameron. He was known as Super Cam uh, at about age two. Um, it does remind me of how he came attired for his interview for chief medical residency. Uh, he came in breathless, sweaty. <clears throat> Uh, he didn't have a shirt. He'd had to walk down the hallway and, and borrow one from somebody. Uh, but uh, he, he at least had pants on. <laughs> and uh, later in his grand rounds, uh, Cameron is going to quote this man, Winston Churchill. But I actually think that a more appropriate person might be this person, Alfred e. Newman. What? Me worry? Uh, Cameron is one of the more low-key, relaxed people that you'll meet. He's very irreverent. Uh, he reminds me of being the opposite of Dr. Dan Port, who worked here some two decades ago. And he was a crusty guy who kind of came across, in fact, we thought that he, on his grave, he would, it would say, it'll never work. And, and Cameron's, Cameron's motto is, why not? <laughs> uh, so uh, this is Cameron. Uh, the other aspect of Cameron, he's doing a headstand on a frozen lake. I actually thought this was uh, photoshopped or something, but he's up in Alaska doing a headstand on a frozen lake. One of the things that you'll find out about Cameron is that he's got a great deal of physical comedy as well as physical ability. He was a uh, college uh, rower and wrestler at MIT, and he's got fantastic physical skills. Uh, here is uh, Cameron and Caitlin building an igloo, literally, up in Alaska. Uh, and here's the two of them on an iceberg exploring. <laughs> now, uh, Cameron's not afraid to get down and dirty. He's at, uh, I don't know if you know about these mudder runs that uh, you race around, you jump over boulders, you go underneath uh, barbed wire, et cetera. It's good preparation for internship. Uh, but actually, the person doing the heavy lifting is Caitlin. Uh, Cameron is a worldwide traveler. This is him ascending Kilimanjaro, the only person who's figured out how to fly up the top of Kilimanjaro. And I'm going to take you back to this picture here. Here's Cameron one more time. I love this picture. He's a super cam. And uh, here he is some 25 years later when he's at the top of Mount Kilimanjaro. He actually does look like Superman here. Um, he's managed to find his pants, but he's lost his cape. <laughs> Now, um, I do have to show that he can dress nicely, but it's only under the auspices of his wife. So here he is with Zephyr, his dog, and here he is with his mom um, at the white coat ceremony at uh, Jefferson Medical College in Philadelphia. Uh, he won every possible prize. I uh, counted them up, and he won seven prizes for best of this, best of that uh, at Jefferson Medical College, and we were quite delighted to have him come here for residency. And here he is. He can dress up nicely. Uh, he's wearing his tuxedo. This is first of, I don't know, four weddings with Caitlin. 
uh, the, the four of them, I, I guess the fourth time they got it right. But anyway, they, they managed to get married several times, and this is in Costa Rica, I think the first of several, right? And then here's the two of them in a moment of reverie. So I'd like to thank Cameron, and before we give him a round of applause, I, we're going to play a little game. He's going to be talking about uh, some of his work in the last couple of years. All of his work, except for one that he's going to present today, was done during residency. So I want you to count up the number of times you've seen the name Bass up there, and the number of times he makes reference to work that he's done. Uh, this is not a brag fest. When we sat down and talked about his chief medical residency grand rounds, um, I said you need to talk about the work you've done and be sure to let the audience know all the good deeds that you've done. Um, and it's quite impressive. So now we need to get serious and give a nice warm round of applause for Cameron Bass, who's done a splendid job. I just want to point out that he is wearing a blazer, but now I'm going to take it from you. Okay. <laughs> that's fair. Uh, this might look familiar because it's the exact same suit that's up on the screen, actually. Actually, he borrowed it from me. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much, Brad. Uh, and I'm very excited to be here. I'm going to be talking about uh, something that I've been spending a lot of time doing, ultrasound and internal medicine. I'm going to tie in some of the other projects I had the opportunity to work on this year while I do this talk, kind of as transition points and analogies as we keep going. Um, I don't have any financial disclosures, although one time I did get paid $700 to sleep in an MRI machine, which I may change the way I feel about certain things. <laughs> I also was told that people should not just present financial disclosures, but also their cognitive biases that are coming into this. So I do have a couple of relevant biases. One is that I absolutely believe that ultrasound is something we all can be using. And the other is that I can't keep the rules about data being a plural word or a singular word straight. And I'm going to mess that up in the talk, and I apologize if that's something that irritates you. <laughs> Uh, so my goals for these grand rounds, uh, Winston Churchill said that a good speech should be like a skirt, long enough to cover the subject and short enough to create interest. And I have more than passing familiarity with skirts, so hopefully I can pull this off. Um, just really quickly, and I promise this is the only audience participation part of the talk, uh, can everyone who's used an ultrasound for diagnostic purposes raise their hand? Okay, so I'm going to start by introducing ultrasound for those of you who, who haven't seen it before. Um, and there's some translations down at the bottom for, for people who are more used to the way I normally talk about this stuff. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about the ways that ultrasound is currently being used inside internal medicine. And then I'm going to talk about some targets for ultrasound and internal medicine that I think have enough of an evidence base that we should be using them. Uh, I'll go through some of the things that are going to be a bit of a challenge as we look forward over the next few years. And then I'll talk about what's on the horizon. Um, just to get things started, one of, the, one of the jobs that I had in the past, I was lucky enough to work at Los Alamos uh, National Labs, and I, I worked on this project. And the basic idea here was we were trying to turn tritium, which comes from moon rocks, honestly, and deuterium, which we get from salt water, into miniature suns. And then we were going to make a power plant out of this. The reason I bring this up is just that I clearly am a nerd. And I love physics, and so when I was thinking about projects that I wanted to work on, um, ultrasound really fascinated me. So now I'm going to try to teach you what you need to know about ultrasound physics in a quick and painless way. And I promise there won't be any math on this portion, uh, except for that one. Uh, so quick shout out to the Fourier transform. Uh, you don't need to understand this to know how ultrasound works, but this is the key to MP3s, cell phones, the streaming video. Some of the sound bounces back, and some of the sound keeps going. And that's going to be the key to how ultrasound sees things that are deep structures in the body. Beyond that, we make some assumptions about the fact that sound travels at the same speed through all tissues, that it travels at a constant speed, and that it goes in a straight line. And then we get together, and we generate an image. And so what basically what happens is each crystal in the ultrasound transducer sends out its signal, listens for the responses, and then the computer puts them together iteratively in order to make the final image that we look at. Um, 
Now I'm going to jump into just a little bit of the historical context for ultrasound. Uh, it's all started with uh, Spallanzani, who was this Italian guy looking at bats, and he said, they know how, where they're going in the dark. They must be using something other than sight. And he said, they're navigating by sound. Um, and then in 1880, the Curie brothers put together this device. This is a piezoelectric um, machine. And basically, this turns sound into electricity or motion into electricity and vice versa. So just with those two bits of understanding, you kind of have all the standard of care now. What you're seeing here is a longitudinal view of the internal jugular and a wire inside of it. Um, so there's been a number of meta-analyses on this and they found that using an ultrasound to do internal jugular canalization reduces the risk of failure by 85 percent, decreases the need for a second attempt by 40 percent, decreases complications by 70 percent, and is recommended by national guidelines. This has become so much a standard of care that even Mark Tonelli uses an ultrasound when he puts in uh, IJs now. It's also part of the package here at the UW. Um, moving on to another procedure, paracentesis, sampling abdominal fluid. What you're seeing here in this video is the cloudy loops of bowel floating at the bottom of the screen and the dark ascites uh, in between the skin and the bowel. So people initially thought, hey, we do paracentesis all the time. We're probably pretty good at it. And then they examined with ultrasound the places where people would have stuck the needle if they used physical landmarks. And they found that in six of the 27 uh, patients used there, they actually would have been unsafe, either because of a loop of bowel floating right near the skin or because of overlying liver. Um, so they randomized people then to either getting a physical exam guided ultrasound, physical exam guided paracentesis, or an ultrasound guided paracentesis, and the success rates were just much higher with ultrasound. The meta analyses since then have shown that you also reduce complications, and I know paracentesis is a relatively safe procedure, but you're talking about a pretty significant reduction in the complication of bleeding, which is an expensive and uh, unfortunate complication to have for what should be safe. Moving on to another procedure, thoracentesis. And what you're seeing here is an ultrasound evaluation of the lung. Um, and you can see the little uh, atelectatic lung flapping in the breeze. You can see the liver in the bottom right-hand corner with the overlying diaphragm. And the maroon color represents the effusion. You also can see the giant black shadow from uh, the rib that, uh, that makes it hard to sometimes interpret what's going on. But this sort of picture. Um, stimulated people to do the same kind of experiments that had been done with paracentesis. They did a pilot seeing how successful people were, and they found that 
while in, with a uh, physical exam, there was a 42% failure rate in identifying a good location for a Thora. Um, with ultrasound, there was a 95% success rate. And that included taking the patients who had failed a physical exam guided thoracentesis and using an ultrasound to guide their thora, for which there was an 88% salvage rate. One pulmonary clinic thought that this was important enough that they made ultrasound for thoracentesis part of their package. And this was a package of an intervention that included a number of things, but also included ultrasound. And they decreased the rate of pneumothorax from 8.6%, which is right in the realm of normal at that time, during that era, to 1.1%. Um, and since then, meta-analyses have shown that the rate of complication, specifically the rate of complication of pneumothorax, has decreased by about half. So now that we know that ultrasound is useful for making procedures safer, the question is how we can uh, teach this to our staff and our residents. So I got to work on a team uh, at ISIS where we developed educational videos. And the important thing here is that we didn't get rid of the physical exam or landmark guidance that we were using before. But we, and we didn't get rid of the sterile technique or safe needle work that we used before. But what we did is we added in cool things like this, showing that ultrasound lets you see inside the patient's body. There was a lot of people on this team, Amy Morris, Jean Zeeler, uh, Michael Ryan. They're, the thing that's important about this is they're from all different specialties, cardiology, emergency medicine, surgery, vascular surgery. Um, and so this was a lot of people thinking about how to teach this safely for everyone. And then we took the residents and we did something that we fondly call the goat rodeo, which meant that we get everybody together in a room on their first day of residency and we teach them how to do central lines under ultrasound guidance. Following this up, though, sometimes there will be six months in between an educational intervention. And so then we started using, this year I uh, worked on a project where I took something from the automotive industry, Toyota called it Kanban, but you guys probably have heard just-in-time training or the just-in-time supply chain, which is basically the idea that Getting people to training right before they need it makes them more likely to use the correct technique when it actually comes time to use it. So what I did is I offered simulation just-in-time training to all of the residents before starting a procedure-heavy service, so before starting our MICU service. Uh, they could come down, practice central lines, practice thoracentesis on mannequins, so that by the time they were doing this on real people, they had had a couple more practice runs under their belt recently. Um, so now we've got things that have already been worked on, things that already uh, make procedures safer. So I'm going to move on to some new targets in ultrasound. And uh, this was a project I got to work on as an undergrad. My senior thesis was taking a wheelchair, and this was a, called the Whirlwind Wheelchair. It was specifically designed for use in the resource-limited setting. The idea was that this was an inexpensive, durable wheelchair made from bicycle parts and stick welding. But the problem was that it was designed for people with paraplegia, which meant that anybody with hemiplegia in the community, anybody who was unable to move one side of their body, couldn't use this wheelchair to get around. So what we did is we added a second rim to one side and a collapsible axle. And by doing this, we made it possible for people with hemiplegia to move uh, using this wheelchair. The idea here is that we identified, <laughs> the idea here is that, <laughs> hopefully the last bit of lights don't go out. Hopefully the, the idea here is that we identified a new target that would make things better. And the three ways that I'm going to try to highlight this for you is in the clinical questions around a patient who presents with shortness of breath, a patient who presents with symptoms of heart failure, and a patient who presents with a DVT. So let's take a, our patient with dyspnea. And I was doing this with our residents throughout the year. Every morning report, we had 10 minutes of ultrasound teaching in a case-based format like this. So Mr. L presents with dyspnea. Uh, he's got a history of heart failure and COPD. He comes in wheezy and hypoxic. He's got a rich, full beard, so it's impossible to assess his neck veins. Um, but you do a chest x-ray and don't, ha don't see any focal opacity. So you decide to do a pulmonary ultrasound. And so now you get this pulmonary ultrasound, and you can see in the picture on the left, the insert, where the probe's being held on the mid-clavicular line. And that means that you're seeing rib shadows. The white arrows are pointing towards ribs, and you can see dark wedges coming down to the bottom of the screen. And the yellow arrow is pointing at the pleural line. The bright, shimmery thing that you're seeing there is the pleura. And deep to the floor, you can see vertical lines that are going all the way to the bottom of the screen. So we know that this is abnormal, and I'll go into how we know that. And then you go onto the other side of the patient's body, and you basically see the same thing, those vertical lines going down to the bottom of the screen. So I'm going to walk you through how you would use this to create a diagnosis. Um, this is going to be a walkthrough of the blue protocol created by Daniel Lichtenstein. Um, he's really been the pioneer in pulmonary ultrasound. Uh, literally stealing it from the radiology department when he was an intern in order to use it surreptitiously at night, according to his autobiography. Um, 
So the idea is this. He wanted to say lung ultrasound alone is enough to make a diagnosis. And he created this diagnostic algorithm that might look complicated, but really only has two questions on it. So the first question is, is there lung sliding? And so looking back at the video that we took of our patient, we're going to, see, we're going to look specifically at their pleural line. And you're going to see that in the red box, that's where the pleural, pleural is, you see this shimmering, this black, white, black, white, or a glistening kind of appearance to the, to the pleural line. That's in comparison to this video. This is a patient who had a pneumothorax that I examined. And if you look at the pleural line here, what you see is that it doesn't shimmer. It just kind of stays as one solid, moving as the patient breathes, but not moving, not doing that glistening and shimmering pattern. So now we've answered the question. Our patient did have lung sliding. So we get to move down one side of the diagnostic algorithm, and we get to the second question, which is, did the patient have B lines or A lines? And so in order to understand that, I'm going to give you a, a picture. On the left, we have our patient with B lines. And on the right, we have a patient who has uh, a normal lung exam. And a normal lung exam is, means that they have A lines. So if we look at the pleura, what we see is that bright line. And then what happens to the sound waves that hit the pleura, they go back to the probe, and the transducer says, all right, there is a pleura there. But some of the sound bounces off the skin, goes back down to the pleura, and then back down to the ultrasound machine. And the ultrasound thinks, oh, there must be another pleura equidistant from that. And this continues. This echoes down. This is what happens because ultrasound really doesn't go through air well. And as a result, the machine has to create all sorts of artifacts to predict what it thinks it's seeing. The good news is that those artifacts are predictable. They're, they're presented in a reliable way, and they present in a specific way in different disease processes. For instance, our patient with these vertical lines going down to the bottom of the screen, these V lines, this is seen whenever you do an ultrasound on somebody who has an alveolar or an interstitial process happening at the place where you put the ultrasound. So our patient had B lines all over the place, so we know that they had a B profile, which means by Lichtenstein's diagnostic algorithm, the patient had pulmonary edema, no other tests necessary according to him. And you might say, well, wait a second, that seems ridiculous. Uh, how good could this possibly be? And I had that question too, so I flew to France, and uh, here you can see me awkwardly hugging Daniel Lichtenstein, who uh, admittedly was curious as to why I was walking around his ICU with the top button on my shirt undone. Um, <laughs> But the question is, how good is this really? And Lichtenstein did a, um, uh, did a trial of this and actually had really impressive numbers. Specifically, if you look at cardiogenic pulmonary edema, the question uh, that we were just talking about, he had sensitivities 97%, 95%, 95%. And if you look at meta-analyses in the emergency room of this technique, you see similar numbers. This has been repeatable. COPD uh, or asthma, also you see good numbers. And I just want to compare this to a chest radiograph, which is something that we've seen our residents ordering for evaluating for pulmonary edema, which just doesn't have the same level of performance. I want to highlight a couple of other um, diagnoses on this, one being pulmonary embolism. Uh, for Daniel Lichtenstein, this meant just that they had a DVT and didn't have one of the other findings, which, as we all know, is a bit of an assumption. And so uh, a little surprising to get the results that he had. But his pneumothorax numbers are really good. And in order to tell you about this uh, a little more detail, I'm going to have to explain receiver-operator curves. So for those of you who aren't familiar with this, receiver-operator curves let you really compare false positives to false negatives as you draw different lines of discrimination. And so if you think of a coin flip, which is a terrible diagnostic test that we all use fairly regularly, um, the receiver-operator curve for a, a coin flip is this perfectly diagonal line. A perfect test looks like this red line, where there's no sacrifice when it comes to false positives and false negatives as you change your discrimination. So now I'm going to show you the receiver operator curves for diagnosing a pneumothorax. On the right, you see the receiver operator curve for a chest x-ray, which is pretty darn good. This is a good test for pneumothorax. But on the left, you see the receiver operator curve for ultrasound, which is spectacular, better than a chest radiograph. And that's been repeatedly shown, but a lot of people say, you know what? Yeah, ultrasound's pretty good if the right person is doing it. And that is a difficult thing to say um, because people say all ultrasound is too hard. But really, it's that specific, ultra specific applications can be easy. And the example I'm going to give is the B lines that we were just talking about. So this was a study that took medical students, first-year medical students, gave them 30 minutes of training and a fairly crappy handheld ultrasound machine and compared it to an echosonographer who had 10 years of experience and a full echo machine. <coughs> And then they had them count B lines. And what you're seeing is really good agreement between the medical students and the echosonographers. And so the conclusion of this article is that from the technological and expertise viewpoint, B lines are the kindergarten of echosonography. 
And we just saw that they're also clinically useful. All right, let's move on to our second case. Uh, so Miss S is a patient who presents with uh, decreased exercise tolerance. She's got a past milk history of heart failure, but with a preserved ejection fraction. She doesn't have any chest pain. She's a little tacky and has some soft blood pressures. We're trying to decide if she has a newly decreased ejection fraction. So you acquire the following ultrasound images. And right here, you're looking at her in fear of vena cava. You can see where the, pro the transducer is being held in the subxiphoid area. And you can see the IVC through the, the window of the liver. And what you're noticing about this IVC is that it's big and it's not changing as she breathes. And that's a comparison to uh, what we'll assume is a normal IVC, because I, I did have a little bit too much coffee on the morning that I acquired this video of myself. But you can see that as I breathe, the IVC collapses more than 50%. And this is a very clear difference. Um, you then move uh, your transducer up the chest and you take a look at her heart. And this is a parasternal long axis view of the heart. And what you're seeing uh, is several important anatomical features, including the left atrium, the aortic outflow tract, the right ventricle, and the left ventricle. And if you look at the walls of the left ventricle here, you can see pretty easily that they're not really coming together all that much. And that's in comparison to our chief resident's heart, who seems to have pretty good left ventricular systolic function. Um, so now the question is, we know that echocardiographers are good at this. We know that they can get really precise numbers, but how much time does it take for somebody to get good at this? And this is a question that's been looked at in a lot of different ways, but I'm going to bring up a couple of trials that specifically I think are relevant. This is just trying to differentiate qualitatively if somebody's LV is functioning normally or abnormally, if it's decreased or normal. And what you see is that after two hours of didactics and three hours of bedside normal exams, uh, a group of ICU docs had a sensitivity of 80% and a specificity of 92% for detecting abnormal function. Um, another, another study used internal medicine residents and gave them a longer period. He gave them 12 supervised studies on both normals and abnormals and had really good numbers, sensitivity and specificity of 94% in a small trial. Um, when they tried doing this with hospitalists, they didn't do the bedside, but they just did 27 hours of didactics, just online stuff, and had not quite as good a performance, but still pretty good. And then in this trial, to give you an outside range, they took residents, gave them three months of training, 100 supervised trials, and you get those numbers that are probably the max. So the question is, how much time does it take to get good at this? And the answer is, I don't know, but it's probably somewhere in between 12 supervised studies and 100, <laughs> um, which is a fair conclusion. So the, um, but this is not ridiculous to start learning. There are several societies that have gotten together and said, this is something we think non-cardiologists can do the American Society of Echocardiography, an international consensus group, the American College of Emergency Physicians, and Society of Echocardiography have all gotten together and said there's certain things that it's reasonable for people to look at. And I got to work on a textbook chapter where we kind of reviewed a lot of this stuff. And we, they basically say that left ventricular abnormalities, and talking just about qualitative assessment of systolic function, gross uh, left atrial enlargement, right ventricular abnormalities, I swear that's not another joke. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and RV, RV enlargement or impaired systolic function. I have, uh, I have two stars next to pericardial effusion because I just want to call it how good bedside ultrasound is for that. In, in meta-analyses of emergency medicine, medicine physicians, they have sensitivities of 96%, specificities of 98% for detecting pleural effusions in patients that potentially have pleural effusion. The guidelines also say that you can look at the IVC. I'll go into why that's a little more complicated in a, later in the talk. And gross valvular abnormalities are large intracardiac masses, which are kind of fuzzy uh, adjectives that make it tough to know what they were really saying. All right, let's move on to our third case. So Mr. W presents with uh, unilateral leg swelling. He says it's been going on since this morning. Um, he's pretty sedentary, uh, <laughs> but he denies uh, having any chest pain or shortness of breath. And unfortunately, the vascular tech is already in bed. So you're thinking about this issue, and you decide to acquire uh, these two videos. So on your left, you can see an evaluation of the femoral vasculature. And on the right, you can see an evaluation of the popliteal vasculature. And you can see the vein and the artery. And what you're seeing is the uh, operator, in this case me, is applying pressure to the transducer. So that I'm compressing the vein to the point where the artery starts to deform, both in the femoral and at the popliteal. And you can see that those veins collapse completely. So based on this, we get to say that the patient doesn't have a DVT. If they did have a DVT, it would look more like this, where you apply compression 
and you can see that uh, the vein does not completely compress. As a matter of fact, you can actually see the beginnings of a clot inside this, fa this vein. So how good is this? In the emergency room, they did this two-point femoral and popliteal uh, compression-only ultrasound for DVTs and found sensitivities of 95%, specificities of 96% in the meta-analysis. That's pretty great, so we tried doing it in our intensive care units. And what we found there was that sensitivity decreased. And the reason that sensitivity decreased in this case was that ICU patients had a clot at the branch point of their deep femoral and superficial femoral veins, the superficial femoral being misnamed because it's still a deep vein in the leg above the knee. So they tried adding a third point of compression. And so this new protocol where they did three points at both the femoral and popliteal and adding in this branch point of those two veins increased their sensitivity up to 88%, which is more in a range where it's really useful. This is so well supported in the evidence that Gene Zeiler, who's the head of the vascular lab here at the UW, encourages non-vascular techs to learn how to do this so that we can do this at night when there's no vascular ultrasound available. The idea of protocols are really attractive. This idea that we can teach this whole, all of these examinations as a single dance. And right here you're seeing Dr. Kimura from Scripps doing his YouTube video showing the CLUE protocol, which is a 60 second protocol um, in order to evaluate patients who are admitted with a cardiac complaint. There's a lot of these. Clue, rush, blue, fast and reliable. ICU sound slip and slide is not actually one. I just put that in there because I like the sound of it. Um, but the idea is that these are out there and these are studied. The problem with these is that these are designed to answer someone else's questions. And we don't know whether they're going to be able to answer the questions that we have about a patient. So the important thing from these studies and these protocols is learning what's important and what's not, what we can leave behind, learning how each part of the protocol performs. Um, so a lot of people have said, uh, said things about ultrasound, talking about how difficult it is and how much of a pain it is. There's, there's this quote, notwithstanding its value, I am extremely doubtful because its beneficial application requires much time and gives a good deal of trouble to both the patient and the practitioner. Other than the odd grammar, this could have been a quote about ultrasound, but actually, this is a quote from 1800. So unless this guy was really thinking forward, he wasn't describing an ultrasound. He was writing the introduction to the original paper about this device, which was Linux stethoscope, which I think is a pretty cool analogy, right? All right, anyway, so, um, uh, so we need to be experts on this, and we need to get our expertise from people who are already doing this. Emergency medicine has made this a part of their training protocol, as has anesthesia. I know cardiologists are technically internists, but there are also uh, specialists who have really dove into ultrasound of the heart. Um, radiology clearly has been interpreting ultrasound for a long time, and our simulation center is really working on ways that we can teach these skills, amongst others, to, to residents. Um, we also need to watch out for pitfalls. So I brought up the IVC before, and the reason I bring it up is this is something I see our residents doing a lot, doing an ultrasound evaluation of the IVC, saying, is my patient in congestive heart failure? But a plump, non-compressible IVC isn't just compressive heart failure. It could be any cause of right heart pressure overload. It could also be because of impaired right atrial filling, whether that's from tamponade or a cardiomyopathy. It could be due to the patient just not breathing hard enough or being on low tidal ventilation in an intensive care unit. There's a lot of things can, that can cause this, and the basic idea is ultrasound doesn't just answer these questions. It gives you tools to answer these questions, but you still have to be a doctor about it. Um, when I asked the question of the room, probably about half the people have, have held an ultrasound, but if I had done this at UC Irving, all of the medical students would have raised their hands. If I'd done this at the University of South Carolina School of Medicine, the same thing would have happened. And if I'd done it at Mount Sinai, the medical students would have already been carrying their own ultrasound machine with them for the entire four years of medical school. So the interns that are right now starting orientation over at Harborview, if they have come from Mount Sinai, they have four years of ultrasound experience with their own machine and a portfolio of images and videos that they've collected and interpreted. So we need to figure out how to be good at this now because we need to figure out how to supervise these residents as they come into our program. And we need to do it ourselves. We need to take knowledge from all the other specialties, but we need to figure out what questions we're asking for internal medicine and what questions we're gonna answer for internal medicine. Last week we had a great Grand Rounds from Dr. Nick Mayo uh, talking about 
the challenges facing the modern uh, physician, and he talked about the fact that interns spend only 12% of their time at the bedside. Uh, so my point here is adding diagnostic ultrasound actually helps this. It brings the physician back to the bedside, and the patients love it. They love to be able to see their heart on the screen while you're talking to them about the change from one day to the next. They love to be able to see their lungs and hear what, you, what your interpretation of this. So that means we get higher quality care, and it's fiscally responsible. So we're talking about really going at this triple aim. So maybe, maybe this is what the, the painting will look like in the future. Um, uh, this is a quick homage to Dr. Steve McGee, uh, who really changed the way I look at the physical exam. His book, highlighting likelihood ratios and the way that we interpret physical exam findings, um, means that we can think about this rationally. And the point here is we need to do this for ultrasound. Um, and so this is one of the projects I worked on specifically was trying to figure out whether ultrasound was useful for diagnosing ARDS. And the inspiration for this came from work that I did in Rwanda where I was in an intensive care unit. And they, uh, they don't have portable chest radiographs. So if you look at this picture, which is actually from a hospital in Thailand that Dr. Owen West took, you can see critically ill patients on ventilators, but without the room for a portable chest radiograph to come through. Uh, so with that, we decided, with that and with a change that to the definition of the acute respiratory distress syndrome, uh, the new Berlin definition simplified this and said what you need are just a few criteria. You need to have an acute problem. You need to have an imaging criteria, which is met with either a chest radiograph or a CAT scan. You need to meet oxygenation criteria, which is measured using a, a ABG, for which you need a blood gas lab. And you need to have the right clinical context. So with this, simple, this uh, simplified definition, we, th we thought about using ultrasound to meet the imaging criteria. And this is, uh, this is due, due to the fact that in those resource-limited settings, ultrasound's versatility just makes it so valuable. You're seeing it being used for obstetrics. You're seeing it be, being used for trauma. And you're seeing it being used for procedures. So it's around. And pulse oximetry is also incredibly common. Any place that has, a, uh, that has an operating room has pulse oximetry capabilities these days. And if they don't, then you can see that if you use my Amazon Prime account, they cost as little as $6. Um, and this isn't crazy. So Liechtenstein, amongst others, has done studies saying, hey, can we use ultrasound to meet the criteria for ARDS? This is a picture of a CT scan in the ultrasound taken at that same site. And using a fairly complex ultrasound protocol of 24 points, he was able to show that ultrasound was almost as good as the gold standard, CAT scan. Uh, for, for meeting the criteria for imaging abnormalities for ARDS, much better than auscultation or chest radiograph. And Rice uh, did a study looking at the ARDSNETS patients, trying to see whether oximetry could predict what, who was going to meet the oxygenation criteria for ARDS. And you can see this is a pretty good receiver-operator curve. So we made the simplest of all ultrasound protocols, that blue protocol that Liechtenstein developed in 2008, and you can see that we just held the transducer at six places on the patient's chest. And then we used the, old, the oximetry readings from when somebody did their uh, ABG for the day and compared that to the chest radiograph from the day, uh, compared the ultrasound to the chest radiograph, the, uh, uh, the oximetry, oximeter reading to the ABG, and we tried to see whether this would meet criteria for ARDS. And we had just fair performance when we actually ran this out. There was a couple of things that I, I think we did right. We, um, we had a really simple protocol, and we showed that it had utility. Um, and we also explored this combination of ultrasound and oximetry specifically for uh, meeting criteria for ARDS in a real-world setting. None of these ultrasound evaluations took more than three minutes at the bedside. This was something that could be done. But we had some limitations, including a, a really small number of patients with ARDS and a challenge that we had with oxygenation, which was that Pulse ox maxes out at 100%, which means that if the patient isn't constantly having their oxygen turned down, you can't use it as to, to clearly draw lines in between, uh, in between somebody who meets ARDS criteria and somebody who doesn't. Moving away from understanding uh, the performance of ultrasound in specific places, I want to talk about another challenge, which is how we're going to get good at this. Um, and I want to uh, put up there another quote that practice makes perfect only, practice does not make perfect, only perfect practice makes perfect from Dr. Lombardi. Um, and the idea is this, we need to figure out how to track the images that we're taking, and we need to have a system for giving feedback to the person acquiring those images. This problem's already been addressed in our emergency room at Harborview where they're using the PAC system that radiology uses and have hired uh, ultrasound fellowship trained emergency medicine physicians to specifically do these overreads and feedback. 
There's also some uniquely American problems, uh, billing and malpractice. So these are problems that haven't really been addressed yet. But in the emergency room, one, one study where they started billing for point of care ultrasound, they developed a billing protocol for it. They had a five-fold increase in documented scans and a net profit after paying their over-readers and establishing a system for storing images of $350,000 for the year. Um, sorry, malpractice is, just means that we have to really focus on credentialing and competence. We have to make sure we have a system for knowing when someone's ready to make a diagnosis when it comes to ultrasound. Uh, so now I'm going to move on to, um, to some of the other things that I think are really interesting. And one of the ways I got into ultrasound, one of the projects I got to work on this year was uh, this device. This is uh, developed by Shift Labs. I was a medical consultant for them. Um, and uh, the point here is that in the resource-limited setting, we can't use the two to $12,000 infusion pumps for IV medications that are used in the hospital. Instead, what happens is people count the drops, and then they do math on the drops which, as everyone knows, is really hard. Doing math is hard, and so people make mistakes. Um, and so what we did is we said, all right, what we're going to do is get a AA battery-powered device that clips onto the drip chamber, does the math for you, and then outputs how fast the infusion's going in in cc's per hour or the amount of infusion that's going, that's going in in milliliters. Um, and this device was thought to be useful. Uh, we were able to win the USAID Grand Ebola Challenge we were one of the 12 winners, and, and that meant I got to fly to Geneva and give a three-minute presentation on this device to the WHO, which admittedly was less stressful than this hour-long presentation. <laughs> um, one of the passions and that you, you're probably seeing flow through with this is that I have is the idea that critical care really is something that can be applied in the resource-limited setting. And I was lucky enough to come here where Dr. Owen West is a part of the Intersect organization, uh, focusing on ways that we can appropriately apply critical care in the resource-limited setting. Um, and I think ultrasound specifically fills a need here. It's inexpensive, it's versatile, it's portable, it's durable, and there's already programs going. When I was in Rwanda, I helped to um, initiate this program, which uh, is now very much on its own called PURE, where they're doing ultrasound education experiments. They're figuring out what the best way is to teach people in these rural settings how to use ultrasound and how to ensure that they maintain competence. Dr. Sachita Shah here uh, at, well, in the UWMC system uh, was part of Partners in Health and wrote this book, The Manual of Ultrasound for the Resource Limited Setting, which is free online and is an excellent place to start if you want to start looking at ways that you can use ultrasound. Um, there's also a lot of other targets when it comes to critical care in the resource limited setting. These are the ventilators that were in that picture from the hospital from Thailand. And they're an example of things that we can probably make more simple and more reliable. Um, talking about the future, this was the bedside ultrasound machine in the 1970s. And these are the bedside ultrasound machines currently available on the market. Um, the upper left-hand corner is a device from GE, and the bottom right-hand corner is a device from a local company called Novasante. And the idea is that these are as small as cell phones, but have really good image quality. They're useful. Um, there's also this, which is a finger-mounted transducer. And trying to avoid the opportunity here to make uh, jokes about what this will do to the digital rectal exam, I want, you to think about, I want you to think about how cool it would be to do a procedure with an ultrasound probe under the sterile gloves on your finger, giving you real-time guidance. So I'm not saying that this is now, but maybe the future is that we're carrying around an ultrasound probe instead of, in addition to, a stethoscope. <laughs> um, so I'd like to just highlight some things I hope that you take away from the talk. Um, I really think that ultrasound-guided procedures are safer, and I think that we, we can show that. Bedside ultrasound can answer some of the common clinical questions that we're faced with, and we got three cases that highlighted that. Ultrasound is coming to internal medicine, and that's a good thing, even if it is a little scary. And I want everyone in the room to keep thinking about simple solutions to problems that you see, to complex technology that we're using. Um, there's a lot of people I want to thank. I had several mentors that helped me out with this. Owen West, Amy Morris, Trish Critic, um, Brad Anwal, and Ken Hug Steinberg um, were great. The ICU nursing staff at all three hospitals tolerated me wandering through their rooms at odd hours in the morning. Um, the chiefs this year, you guys, inspired me, uh, and we solved all of our problems with manyness. The greatest house staff in the known universe, Ursula Bell made being a chief an absolute pleasure. Kelly, Caitlin, Brittany, Kelly, the other Kelly, and Maddie in the, um, in the residency office, and Doug Powell, Yvonne, Yolanda, Kathy, and Carmelita in the, in the med student programs. And most of all, uh, my wife, Caitlin, who has tolerated me being both extraordinarily eccentric and occasionally late to dinner. 
uh, for the last year. Um, so with this picture of the last time I really got my butt whipped uh, in a wrestling match, I'd like to take some questions. Before we uh, have Cameron take questions, I just want to comment on two things. One, this is a really nice reminder of the privilege of being a physician and how we're invited into patients' lives to take care of them. But the other component of this talk is the joy of being in medicine. And I'm pretty sure that Cameron has never worked a day in his life, nor is he ever going to, because it's all play. So as you go forward today, just think about what a wonderful job we have. Uh, it's, it's not work. It's play. So thank you for that, Cameron. Thanks. I'm reminded of the Tigger song. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that was fun. So you mentioned the use of uh, simulation for initial training and uh, to refresh skills. Uh, as you were using this to train your residents, did you see any awkwardness or transition going from the simulator to a live patient? Yeah, thanks. Dr. Sheehan uh, works on simulation technologies and so is very much an expert in this. So, uh, so yeah, there is a, an awkwardness when it comes to the transition from simulation to real patients. That's something we see all the time. No simulator that I've currently gotten to use is perfect. Some are definitely better than others. The thing that I keep coming back to is it's the best that we have. It really is better to be doing this over and over again on a, on a simulated device or a simulated procedure than to kind of inflict the first time you've held this probe onto a, a real person who needs it. And so I think of simulation as the best we have and an important step in the process of developing the expertise. Yeah. Is there a problem with maintenance of skill over time if it's something that you're not using regularly? Yeah, great question. And so the answer is yes. Clearly, if people don't use a skill, it degrades, whether that's physical exam skills or conversation with people who aren't as awkward as I am. The, uh, the basic idea is we need to have a system for maintaining skill. And that, that pure program that I talked about is trying to evaluate how frequently you need to have re-education uh, interventions in order to maintain skill in the resource-limited setting. Here it's uh, a little bit fuzzier because it's hard to really design a clean trial on this. The best that I could come up with was this idea of just-in-time training, this idea that whenever somebody knows they're going to do a procedure, there's a video on how to do it that they can watch that minute, or there's a simulation lab where they can go the day before and really refresh the things that they learned. Simulation is, is certainly not perfect, but when it comes to maintaining skill and getting that muscle memory back, it seems like a pretty good alternative. Dr. Johnson. You presented some diagnostic studies that have very impressive sensitivities and specificities, and I was wondering if you had found any cases where ultrasound was being used to define a disease where the gold standard was actually a physical exam. Oh, interesting. Uh, I don't know of any cases where that's been where that's been done yet. They may be out there, but I, I don't know. Sorry. So, Cameron, thank you. Great talk. Um, can you, for folks in the audience who are interested in learning more about ultrasound, how to um, perform it, practice it, uh, incorporate it into their practice, can you make some recommendations for folks how folks might get started yeah. in learning more? Great. Um, so. There's a, the program I talked about, the educational initiative being worked up with ISIS, is going to be freely available when it comes to procedural ultrasound. So that's going to have videos that have been produced inside the UW that you can watch and learn about it. There's also a fair number of organizations doing this and putting their, their curriculum up for free. Um, so I unfortunately don't have a slide of, of educational resources, but, um, but they're out there. The thing I want to warn people about is that YouTube, while it's an easy way to search for uh, examples on how to do these things, is not peer-reviewed. Um, as long as you don't count the comments down at the bottom, which I guess is a form of peer review, but certainly not one you want to spend time reading. Um, so be careful when you look for YouTube videos. But several of the companies that manufacture ultrasound machines have made reliable ultrasound demonstrations uh, created by physicians that can teach you how to use ultrasound for a, specific, um, for a specific purpose. And they're a nice place to start, whether it's the Sonicide educational videos or the um, GE educational videos on how to use ultrasound for a purpose. 
Hi there. Hi. Um, I just wanted to say thank you. And I think for those of us in the residency program, you've made yourself extremely available to always do the simulation, um, be in the ISIS lab, do whatever sort of bedside ultrasound practice that we can think of. Um, before these videos are readily available to us, have you tapped anybody to sort of try to fill your shoes for next year? And that will be our go-to person. Uh, yeah, so uh, the videos should be ready soon, I promise. Um, the, uh, we're, the goal is to have them ready for this, this incoming intern, intern class. Um, there's going to be a, uh, two new chief residents starting uh, in a few days. And, uh, and they both said that this is something that they want to keep going. And so they're working on, on the skills necessary to make sure that they're, they're equipped to teach this stuff. So hopefully this is something that continues after I leave. The first batch of videos are live now on the ISIS website. <laughs> I have just been told. Cameron, thank you again uh, for your enthusiasm for ultrasound and for translating that uh, to a very static uh, slide talk, which is great, uh, hard to do. Um, I'm going to ask you a question from pre-hospital and out-of-hospital providers. So I interact a lot with flight nurses who work in rural Alaska and with paramedics who work in the streets uh, around our uh, Puget Sound Basin. And they all want to know how long until I can use ultrasound because some of the physical exam findings in particular, auscultation, are impossible in their working room. Yeah, this is a great question. And so actually, I tried to start a project to see if we could answer this question. I worked with, uh, with Rich, one of the heads of Airlift Northwest, to try to see if we could develop a project to use ultrasound during flights. So the flights from Alaska are four hours long. And one of the clinical questions that comes up frequently is, does my patient have a pneumothorax? And as we saw, ultrasound is really good for this. Um, and auscultation in an airplane, for those of you who haven't tried it, is a waste of time. So, um, so we, we haven't gotten that study off the ground yet. I do think there's certain places where it's worthwhile, times like that where you're stuck in a, an airplane for hours at a time. The challenge, I think, is my understanding is that the most important thing with pre-hospital care is getting the patient to the emergency room as fast as possible. And I worry that even the couple of minutes that it takes to get the machine started up, get the machine applied to the patient, make sure you're seeing what you think you're seeing, is delay that probably outweighs the benefit at this time. I think there's potential for it in the future, but, but right now I think it's a little early to be using. Dr. Brody. Dr. Bess, thank you for a wonderful talk and for your manifest enthusiasm all through this year. It's just <laughs> remarkable what you've accomplished. Radiology has a very robust uh, QI process. A small percent of their films every day are, are overread by other radiologists, and then they have an organized feedback process of did they see everything was there and did they agree with the interpretation, and, and, and that's really a, a marvelous thing for our radiology department. Um, what are your thoughts about what we would do to make sure that our skills are up to par on the inpatient setting when we're using ultrasound? Yeah, to be, this is a great question. And to be totally honest, I think this is one of those times where we can just learn from the experts in this. Radiology has been doing this, has figured out how to do this process of overreading and feedback. And in the emergency room uh, at Harborview, they're storing their images and having attending overreads. And I don't know for sure whether they're doing the second attending overread, but I. I think that this is one of those cases where other people are doing this already for imaging. We can do this for imaging. It's just a matter of establishing the systems to do it. Hi, on a related question. So what have you um, seen that hospital uh, committees have done with uh, privileging? Um... <laughs> uh, I, I think they've formed several committees. <laughs> uh, <laughs> which I've had the pleasure of, uh, of sitting in on a couple of meetings. This is a tough question because it's not just a hospital question. This is a national question. How do you privilege somebody for ultrasound? In internal medicine, we just don't really have that system in place yet. And so, um, and so I, don't, I don't think the, the pressure to do that quickly has really been realized yet. I think that as these medical students who were at Mount Sinai in schools like it start moving into our residency and, and this becomes more commonplace, that pressure is going to become a lot higher. Um, so yeah, so sorry, short answer to your question, there are committees working on it. <laughs> yeah. I, I was impressed by the data you showed about how much money an emergency room made doing this. What is the guard against overusing this? Yeah, great. So an emergency room made a lot of money doing this in a year. So how do we, how do we stop for overbilling for this procedure? I do not know the answer to that question. The, um, 
The thing that I think is important here is we still haven't really figured out how this fits into the billing architecture. Is this part of our physical exam? Is this just part of the time we spend with our patients? Um, and I think we have to answer those questions in order to make sure that we don't fall into, the, into that pit of, hey, this is a way to make quick money. I'm just going to lay the ultrasound probe on you even though I know what I'm looking at. In the same way that we have choosing wisely campaigns for unnecessary lab tests or uh, unnecessary imaging in other fields. All right, great. Thank you all very much. Thank you.